Hello, welcome back to the channel. A bit of a different picture today, but a lot of the same information. Today we're going to take a deep dive into the transition. How do you do it? When do you do it? And what's the real details you've got to be working on? Here in Germany, we're not only in lockdown, it's snowing, and that makes it a little bit difficult for me to get out on a driving range and do anything which is going to help you guys. So I thought I would take the opportunity to come indoors and talk you through a particular part of the golf swing. Now, one of the reasons that YouTube works is that we're all basically trying to describe the same thing and we're describing the same things over and over again. And if you look at enough videos, you'll eventually find somebody that you actually understand. And that's one of the major problems that all teachers have when they're working not only with videos, even with books. And the idea is basically to transfer information to you. The trouble is that the word can be your jailer and it can be your liberator. If you understand the word, whether it be spoken or written, then it could certainly liberate you from all of the problems that you've had in the past. But interpret it incorrectly and it can be your jailer stopping you from being able to move forward with your goal swing and making the whole operation of learning any particular part of your swing very, very difficult indeed. And that's the reason really I've not been lazy over uh, the lockdown. I've been um, swatting and revising and rewriting my PDF, The Philosophy of Golf, which is basically my idea of how to learn a golf swing. The reason I've done this is because the, um, the old philosophy was a bit of a jumble of ideas which I'd kind of put down and put it out as a 99 cent PDF that you could download. What I thought is that as long as I've got this thing, then why don't I use it correctly and basically link it to the videos on YouTube so that you've got the best of both worlds. Often, if you have a written text, you can actually put in more information that you can do if you're performing in front of a camera. You've got to shorten it. You've got to be using a lot more kind of uh, one-liners, really, whereas um, the, the beauty of a book is that basically I can put down as much as I want because I know that my reader has a good deal more time than I have when I'm presenting a video. Unfortunately, there's no moving pictures there and sometimes it's very difficult to kind of uh, impart a feeling to you. If you can't hear me, you can't see me. Um, and so by putting the work together and actually putting links into the PDF so that when you download it, you can either watch the video or read the text or do both at the same time if you're good at multitasking. And I thought this way, um, I'm going to hit as many people as I can and hopefully get as many of you to actually understand what it is that I'm trying to tell you um, because I know it can be very difficult at times. Um, as long as we're in lockdown over here and it's going to be difficult to get on the driving range because of the weather, I thought what I'd do is I'd take the opportunity of basically going through particular chapters in the book uh, or in the PDF and basically trying to explain them a little bit more in detail. Um, and I'll use some of the old videos that we've had just to so that you can actually see a moving picture and you don't have to stare at me for the next 20 minutes. Um, but the idea would really uh, be to go through individual parts of the swing that we know are really causing amateur golfers a lot of problems. And I want to start today with the transition um, or what I call the move. Um, my golf academy has been called The Move for the last 25 years, so that's how long I've been trying to explain it to my students. And I think I'm getting pretty good at it, but um, I still find now and again, Dave, you know who you are, um, some of my students still don't quite understand what I'm getting at. And a lot of times um, they're hearing so many things on the net, reading so many books that they don't realize that they're actually blocking the information themselves because they actually do have their own belief structures. You actually believe that something has to be like this. Also, sometimes you're taking both the written word and also the spoken word far too literally. So the trick here is basically to say, okay, um, what is it that we're wanting to learn and what's the best way of doing it? 
So the first thing I want you to do is to basically kind of sit down, relax, take a deep breath, hold yourself, get yourself a cup of coffee or something stronger um, if you need it and just try and kind of suck this information in. It's all about basically the transition, the transition between your backswing and your downswing. Uh, for me, in the meantime, I think there's really three main stages in a golf swing, although obviously you can strip them down uh, to thousands of different separate points in a golf swing. I think there's three main stages. The first stage being the backswing, as of taking the golf club away from the ball to the top of your swing. The second stage being the transition, what I will call the move. And then the third stage being the release and the follow through. Everything you're doing in the golf swing is basically leading towards the release, but the big key packed factor which binds the backswing and the release is this thing called the transition, or for me, the move. And it begins before your arms and hands have actually reached the top of their golf swing, you should be starting to move in the opposite direction with your body. Now, in the backswing, if you think about it, um, your hips will stop turning a little bit before your shoulders stop rotating. But once your shoulders stop rotating, you should be starting the downswing with this transition. And in the transition, you're trying to get your body into this perfect position to release the golf club through the ball. That means that the club should be, if possible, on plane and the club face should be square. That means at right angles, not to the target line, but to the plane of your golf swing before you release it. And that means that you don't need to be twisting or turning or doing anything with the club face to square it up into impact. If you can get it on, on plane and uh, the club on plane and square at this position at the start of your release. And it's really the moves job to get you there. Now, if you look at a lot of professional and amateur backswings, you're going to see in a lot of different positions at the top of the golf swing. And that's why we need some kind of binding sequence which will maybe correct a couple of mistakes that you might have made in the backswing and help you to get the club back on plane, the club face back in the position you want it when you release it through the golf ball. When you're releasing it, you should just be hitting it as hard as you possibly can, getting as much energy into the golf ball as possible without having to worry about whether you're gonna find it again. So really getting the move right is imperative. And this move has got to basically get everything into this right position, this correct position. So how does it actually do that? Well, if you actually go through it with me, if you've downloaded the PDF, you'll find it on page 35, or at least the start of it. Um, what's actually happening is as your shoulders stop rotating, you should have a considerable amount of um, tension and also torsion or torque in your body. And you're going to use that to actually start rotation in the opposite direction, first in your lower body and then in your upper body. But when we're talking about sequence of movement, we're talking about milliseconds. And sometimes that's one of the problems that you have is that you're thinking, okay, I've got to start turning my hips and then I start turning my shoulders. But in truth, as far as your awareness is going, your feeling is going, it's happening at the same time. You are not trying to restrict one movement to get another movement to start. However, if you do go into super slow motion, you will be able to see that maybe the lower body actually starts to rotate back towards the target before the upper body. Unfortunately, it's not just a question of rotating the lower body. We always also want to load the lower body even further to get ready for the release. If the release is going to be a release of energy, then we need energy to release it. And this energy is not only just going to come out of your arms and hands and the golf club, it's also going to come out of the ground. So one of the ways of actually loading the ground is by basically making a small kind of dipping movement 
as you start the downswing. And you'll see this in an awful lot of great players, very predominantly, strangely enough, in the smaller guys like McElroy, uh, Justin Thomas, um, because they are really trying to use the ground as much as possible to get um, a little bit of speed that maybe the bigger guys haven't got because the bigger guys are getting it basically since the length of their arms and the, and the, the height of the body. But if you actually see that, what's actually happening is they're breaking their knees, they're also changing their hip position, their pelvis is tilting backwards, and that's helping them. At the same time, they're getting their hips and pelvis to rotate. And this is where it starts to get very, very complicated. On top of that, the, uh, their upper bodies, the upper body is actually going to have to retard the arm swing, stop the arms and club moving up, change the direction, bring the arms and, uh, and, and club back onto plane and get the club squared up to come through the golf ball. So how does this all happen? Well, what I want to do is just kind of explain to you it really as far as I can in, in the correct sequence of events. And that way, hopefully, you might actually be able to kind of feel this thing. And then there's a, a couple of drills that you can do which will get you the feeling. So the first thing that you want to be thinking about when you get to the top of your golf swing, and again, I'm not talking about when your hands and arms and club get to the top of the golf swing. I'm talking about when your shoulders stop rotating. And the very first thing really that you're going to feel, you've got to kind of go down into your trail foot and your trail shoe and feel how that your trail foot is actually twisted in the shoe. You're going to use the inner wall of the shoe and you're going to press away from the inner wall, which is going to start basically your rotation. And at the same time, you're going to let your knees break and your hips tilt backwards. By doing this, you're going to go into what feels like almost free fall with your bum. You're actually going to fall a couple of centimeters or a couple of inches, depending on how much time you have and how athletic you are. And by allowing that to happen, you might even experience a short amount of kind of weightlessness. Now, this is actually a position because this happens so quickly where the arms are actually going to be feeling as though they're doing absolutely nothing at all. They are actually working very hard. They're actually working against the club, which is still trying to disappear back behind you and over your trail shoulder. So it's not as if they're not doing anything, but at this time, you're gonna have that feeling. Some people interpret it as a pause in their golf swing. It's not because the body isn't doing anything. It's just because they're in this kind of moment of almost free fall. And if your trail foot has actually started that twisting in its own shoe, pushing you around, then you are actually going to start your body rotating, although it's free falling. So it's doing a lot of things at the same time. The hips are being rotated back towards the target. The lead hip is coming back. The trail hip is hopefully not moving forward too quickly, just allowing the trail, the lead hip to come back and the hips are basically rotating towards the target. At the same time, your shoulders have got to be bringing the club down. Now, obviously, the rotation that you've started in your lower body will kind of work up your spine and help your shoulders to rotate. But what it will first of all do is it will try and rotate your shoulders in the same plane as your hips are rotating. We don't want that because the hips are rotating in a flatter plane then your shoulders are rotating in. So in order to get your shoulders rotating in the correct plane, you've got to have a feeling that your, your trail shoulder is kind of moving back and down. This is kind of a rowing movement that I talk about in some of the videos. Um, the trick is, the, uh, is to get that feeling that as your hips rotate in one direction, your shoulder comes down. And you're going to do this by, by shortening and contracting um, your trail muscles. They are mainly obliques, chest muscles, and a great big muscle in the back called the latissimus. And the latissimus is extremely important when we get into this transition, into this move, because that is also going to be pulling your arms down. And it's going to do this quite simply because the latissimus is actually attached to your upper arm. And that means that when it contracts, it not only pulls the shoulder down, it also pulls the arm down. And this is something you can see in an awful lot of go good golf swings where the 
trail elbow seems to kind of be pulled in towards the trail hip. This is not something that should be done just by dropping the hands and pulling the elbow towards the hip. It's something which will actually happen automatically if you contract the latissimus in, the, in this transitional period. And that will actually bring your arms down without you having to actively pull down on the golf club. Now, this is not to say that you're not going to be pulling on the golf club, but what you're actually going to be doing with your arms and hands during this transitional move phase is more resisting the forces which are working on the golf club. Because the golf club, as I said, is first of all trying to kind of disappear somewhere behind your neck. And then when you change rotational uh, forces and start moving back towards the target, you are actually transferring energy into the golf club and it's not going to like it. Um, it's going to resist these forces. And this is why if you look in slow motion at the top of the golf swing, you can actually see the shaft bending back towards the toe of the club because of the forces that are working on the shaft. And obviously the forces working on the shaft are working on the shaft because your arms are applying force to the shaft. So they can't be just hanging there like a couple of kind of loose spaghetti. It's got to actually be working. It's got to be resisting the forces that the club is actually applying to the hands. And um, that is something which is extremely important to know. Although in the transitional phase, you're going to have more of the feeling of your arms being passive. They are not passive. They are actively working against the forces of the club. What they are also doing is helping to get the club down to a roundabout uh, hip height where you're going to then release it through the golf ball. And to do that, you're going to have to have the feeling of the lead arm pulling and the trail arm starting to straighten. This will also cause a slight amount of release in your wrist. So we're not talking about holding wrist angle here either. Normally the momentum and the weight of the golf club would be quite adequate to hold the wrist angle, but the wrist angle will release slightly as well as the elbow angle as you come into this transition. So don't be trying to hold any of these angles. On the contrary, you want to be trying to make the transition or the move as dynamic as possible. Now to a certain extent that's going to be about the forces of gravity basically working on your bum and pulling it down but it's also about how you're actually interacting with the ground. On This is one of the things that sometimes kind of gets wrongly interpreted, interpreted. How can you fall and move at the same time? If I were to stick somebody in a, in, in a vacuum and then uh, pop them up into space and put them in a, one position, they wouldn't be able to move because there's nothing that they can push against. Although you are falling in the feeling that your bum is going down, your knees are giving way, if you really kind of get into it and feel it, you'll actually feel that your calf muscles and feet are actually working very hard indeed because they are offering the stability which is suddenly being taken away from your knee joints and your hip joints. And they're gonna have to work ultra hard. And at this time, rather than your feet kind of pushing down into the ground, what they're doing is twisting. And both of them will be doing this. So you'll have in the move phase, both, both lead and trail foot kind of twisting in, into the ground getting your hips to rotate in the opposite direction. Also your glutes, your bum muscles, your lower back muscles will also kind of get in on this and be helping you to get round. And the speed with what, which you can actually get your hips rotating is going to obviously um, have a great impact on the speed that you can then rotate your shoulders. Because if your hips are rotating quickly, like I said, they will transfer this rotational energy through your spine to your shoulders, which will help your shoulders to rotate quickly. So the base speed is coming out of your hips. Your shoulders are then actually increasing that base speed. And on top of that, your shoulders are pulling your arms. Your arms are pulling the golf club down 
increasing base speed again. And really this base speed that we then have in the hands is what we're going to then multiply by using the leverage in the release of the club and the wrists. And that's basically how you get this immense amount of club head uh, speed, uh, despite a relatively slow rotation in your hips and shoulders. And that's one of the things where the physics really does come into itself. And if you remember, catapults were weapons that they used to use in wars, throwing massive bits of oh, boulders at walls to actually break them down. And that was all basically using levers. And that's how you get the catapult effect. That's how you generate speed um, through the golf ball. But the trick is to create speed in your transition, in your move, by getting this feeling of a quick rotation at the same time your bum going back and turning, at the same time resisting with your arms, getting the club down on plane. As far as the club actually coming down on plane, whether it is steep or whether it is flat, it's all about basically having the feeling as you change direction that you are actually allowing the club's weight to pull the club down and flatten its plane slightly in the downswing. If you've already got a pretty flat plane in the downswing, you won't really be able to do this because physically you have more rotation in your lower arms. When you got to the top of your backswing, if however you had very little rotation in your lower arms, then the combination of forces working from your body through your arms to the club will help you to actually flatten the club out and get it back onto plane. And you're looking to really try and get the, the shaft more or less back onto a plane that it had at the address position. And then it will drop down into this original plane. Um, the, for the majority of us, we're a little bit steeper than the original plane. And because the uh, of the lower body rotation and the shoulder rotation, you, that's quite okay. You're actually getting the shoulders helping the club more down onto the original plane with the golf ball. And really, I think that's about as detailed as you can get in a video about the transition. Um, how are you going to practice this? Well, the best thing is really to get out and kind of separate these things. And if you go into the PDF and get, look up drills, um, the first three drills basically show you how to put this together. First of all, getting a feeling just for how your lower body works, how this move would actually function. The second thing then combining the upper body to work with the lower body. And then finally, uh, adding your arms and hands to this, this uh, uh, big movement, which we call a golf swing. And by drilling your body, that's how you basically get the automation. Um, I'm sticking by the old adage of around about 1800 repetitions over six weeks or even eight weeks to actually get this kind of repetition. Um, the more you do, the better it is. Um, and the more time you take, the deeper it goes. So it's all about practice, practice, practice. A little bit different. Next time I'll be back with another chapter out of the book. Um, hope you liked it. If you did as ever, please smash the like button. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. That helps us immensely. If you really want to help the channel, uh, beyond uh, watching the videos, I also now have a Patreon account. I shall leave a link below. If you sign up for that, whether you sign up for $5 a month or $10 a month or $25 a month, then there are certain little bonuses, including for the top tier. Um, I will be doing monthly uh, streaming videos where you can ask me directly, ask me questions, and I'll hope to give you some answers. Um, that will be starting in the summer. Um, until then, look after yourselves, stay well, stay healthy, we'll see you all soon.